coming up on this episode of Crime Family. This is part three of our Kaylee Anthony murder case coverage. Very interesting trial for sure that went on for many weeks and many people were glued to the TV for the for the trial. The defense in this case is claiming that this was actually not a murder at all, but instead it's a manslaughter case. He was part of the cover-up and they go after him, but he denies knowing anything about it. Yeah, so it's like kind of like the epitome of like the courtroom drama of like one expert witness and then one that debunks that and then that just doesn't seem plausible to me this kind of kind of sounds like a dream did something accidentally happen to kaylee while casey was on the computer or did casey murder her child Hello, everyone. Welcome to Crime Family. I'm your co-host, AJ, and I'm here with Stephanie and Katie, my two sisters. And this is part three of our Kaylee Anthony murder case coverage and the trial of Casey Anthony. So if you haven't listened to the first two parts, go back and do that because we have kind of went through a lot of information that kind of led us to where we are at in the trial now. And this episode, we're going to cover the bulk of the trial and the prosecution and the defense and their different approaches and theories and we're going to kind of take a deep dive into the trial um so yeah definitely go take a listen to our previous two parts because they're going to be important (laughs) the stuff that we covered in the first two episodes will be important for this for this episode as well but um without further ado we are going to just get right into it so in april of 2009 it was announced that the prosecution was going to be seeking the death penalty in this case and this was a, a huge development because, of course, the death penalty is the most is the biggest thing that you can go for in a criminal trial. And the prosecution decided that they felt confident they had enough evidence to be able to seek the death penalty in this case. So before they went to trial, they had to find people for a jury that hadn't already made up their minds whether Casey was guilty or innocent. So they brought in Richard Gabriel, who was one of the best trial consultants in the country. And he was brought in to help pick a fair jury. And because this was the most high profile case in America at the time, it was difficult to find people who didn't already have some type of opinion either way. Like we had said before, there was a lot of information being given to the media and lots of reporting on it. So there was so much information out there that so many people knew about. So you can't really find a non-biased jury, at least in Florida, it'd be really hard to do that. And so... Casey's defense team was also trying to get the trial moved out of Orlando for that reason, because of how high profile it was. But the judge at that time denied this motion. So when the trial begins on May 9th of 2011, all the lawyers have to travel to a different part of Florida to an undisclosed place in order to pick a jury there. And this was because they wanted to make the trial a little bit more private and for Casey to have a a fair shake in order to give her as fair a trial as they could. So they put actually put together a focus group with 12 adults um, in this other area outside of Orlando. And 12 is obviously the same amount that a jury would have because they wanted to see if the people in this focus group had the same thinking as the people in Orlando. So when the case had already been all over the media, it's really hard to find people who know little or nothing at all about this case. So there was a lot that kind of went into jury selection and how they got to their final 12 jurors that both the defense and the prosecution were comfortable with. The trial began in May of 2011, and Katie's going to kind of take it from there. This trial included almost around 100 witnesses, and there was over 33 days of testimony. 
So as you can imagine, there is a lot to unpack here during the trial. So I am going to touch on kind of the biggest pieces of evidence and that maybe the most controversial things that went on during the trial. And there was quite a bit of forensic evidence in this case. And let's say quite a bit, I guess there's not a ton, but there are some big things that stand out. And it goes back and forth between being beneficial for the defense and then it's beneficial for the prosecution. And a lot of this is kind of based on expert opinions about each piece of evidence that differ from each other. So just keep that in mind because a lot of the experts couldn't agree with each other on what was, you know, what actually happened, what was significant and what wasn't. We mentioned her before, Dr. Jan Garaviglia or Dr. G, and she was the medical examiner at the time. And she says in the documentary called Dr. G inside the Kaylee Anthony case that when the remains were found, there was no soft tissue at all left to be tested. And they did testing for drugs, specifically chloroform, on the remains anyway, but they were not able to find any traces of those substances due to the state of decomposition. Now, if you remember from the previous episodes, we talked about the search on the computer for chloroform. And so this was kind of a big thing for the prosecution. And so, like I said, they weren't able to find any traces of chloroform or any other drugs due to the state of decomposition. And Dr. G also stated that they also could not find any traces of the chemicals or the substances that are usually present during decomposition. You know, as everything breaks down, the body secretes certain liquids and chemicals. And she just said it's because the body was so decomposed that there really was nothing left. So her point was, just because they couldn't find it doesn't mean that it wasn't there. So I think she's just trying to leave that open to say there could have been chloroform use, but we just couldn't find it. And we also couldn't find any chemicals at all. So yeah, she says that not finding chloroform or any other drug doesn't mean it wasn't used. It was just too late for them to be found in the remains. The prosecution also emphasizes the fact that Kaylee was missing for 31 days before it was reported. And with all the evidence that we talked about, the smell of decomposition in Casey's trunk, the chloroform, the duct tape around Kaylee's skull when she was found, and the abundance of lies that Casey told throughout the case, the prosecution's theory is pretty straightforward. They claim that Casey used chloroform to render Kaylee unconscious, and then they put the duct tape around her nose and mouth. And Kaylee suffocated and was placed in the back of Casey's car, and then she was eventually dumped in that swampy area where she was found. So that is the prosecution's theory on what happened. Now, like I mentioned, the foundation of the prosecution's case was that Casey used chloroform to knock out and maybe sedate Kaylee. And as you may know, or maybe you don't know, chloroform is not easy to buy. Like, you can just go to a store and buy chloroform. You can purchase it as an industrial solvent, but it's one of those things where there would be, for sure, be a paper trail surrounding that. Um, it's like a controlled thing, so they can see who bought what and where and how much and where it went and things like that. And so as far as we can tell, there was no evidence of anyone purchasing chloroform. The prosecution presented that Casey had made her own chloroform herself because I guess there was evidence that someone had searched how to make chloroform. And then they're saying that's what she used to sedate Kaylee. In the documentary called The Case of Kaylee Anthony, they go into the fact that, I don't think they presented this in the trial, but this is um, just kind of like an aside here. They go into the fact that making chloroform at home for the average person would be very difficult. And... I guess it would be hard to convince anyone that Casey would be able to do that. And like you would need equipment, you need a distiller and all these different chemicals and everything. And so their point was like, why would you go that route when there's so many other ways to kill someone or render someone unconscious? Like you don't need chloroform for that. And so I think this is one place where the prosecution may have lost the jury when trying to convince them that Casey made her own chloroform. And further in that documentary, Dr. Henry Lee, he's come up before in other cases, he talks about the trunk of Casey's car. And he says that there was a spare tire that was missing in the back and where that spare tire would have been. He noticed there was lots of glue when he lifted up the carpet lining of the trunk, which is normal because I guess the lining's glued down. But he says that could have been the source of the traces of chloroform that were found when they tested her trunk. I guess some manufacturers of glue 
have similar chemicals to chloroform. So he said that's a possibility from where that chloroform came from. Because they do, I think the investigators did do like an air test or something in the trunk, which then did come back positive for chloroform or like small traces of chloroform or something, if, if, I, if I'm remembering that. Yeah, they found really small traces. That's why the prosecution like hung on to this chloroform theory for dear life. So then like if it is the lining of in that type of car, if you did that same test on any car with that make and model, would it still come back positive for chloroform, I guess? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question, a good point. I, No one has brought that up from every, anything that I've seen, but I would presume so if, like, that's how they make the cars. Yeah, that'd be, like, a good test for someone to do. Did they ever search her house to see if they could find chloroform? Because I don't remember that being brought up in any things I watched. Yeah, I mean, they, there was no evidence that there was chloroform in her house, that they had purchased chloroform, made chloroform. Like, they, they could not find chloroform anywhere. So I think that was kind of the thing that people were saying the prosecution was kind of grasping at this chloroform theory because the only like the only mention of chloroform was that trace amount in the trunk. Yeah. And like, yeah, it makes sense. Like, so they knew that there was chloroform in the trunk, so they had to make it go fit into their story somehow. So, but it wasn't any in the house. There wasn't any other traces of it anywhere except except in that trunk. And there wasn't any on the body, which I guess doesn't mean anything because there's nothing on the body, right? Yeah, exactly. They couldn't find traces of anything on the body. Yeah. So, I mean, they had a hard time identifying her. Like, that's how decomposed she was. And they didn't find any traces of it on the duct tape either, because they found nothing on the duct tape, right? No, there's no traces of anything on the duct tape either. So, yeah, it was like very small trace amounts of chloroform in the trunk. Yeah, they can't really connect that confidently to anything, really. To me, the chloroform is a weird thing, because it's like, why would there be duct tape on the skull if, like, you... If you used chloroform and she died, why would you put why would you need to put duct tape over someone's mouth if you're using chloroform? Like to me, that's you know what I mean? It's just weird. If they had like the duct tape and then like a cloth with chloroform on it and then duct taped around her. Like around her head. Yeah, but there's no evidence that there's a cloth duct taped to her skull when they found it. There was no fibers or anything on the duct tape. No, there wasn't. So there there's no evidence of that at all. Let me just say there's no evidence of chloroform anywhere ever except that tiny trace in the trunk that could have been the glue or even could have been cleaning products somebody brought up so well and and the search on the computer though mm, yeah that's a good point too yeah so i think that is why they clung so hard to this chloroform theory because of that search on the computer and then they're like oh my god it's actually in the trunk so they probably used it so that's where that came from for sure but in one of the things i read there was a computer at the anthony's house that everybody used everybody knew the password to it so it could have been anybody that search that not necessarily just Casey yeah but why are you searching that I don't think it's a matter of like who did it but why is you searching that no I know I'm I'm just saying like it could have been Casey but I'm just saying like everybody else had access to that computer so it could have been I touch on this a little bit too where it's like all the searches they have they have no proof of who actually searched them because even if Casey was logged in on the computer under her username like she could have just left that open somebody else could have used it while you know while she was logged in so they didn't really have any proof to say who logged in or who searched what. Yeah, so that's another thing that they can't figure out either. So the defense in this case is claiming that this was actually not a murder at all, but instead it's a manslaughter case. They claim that Casey did try to cover up what happened, but that she was not responsible for the death of Kaylee. And the defense claims that Kaylee actually drowned in the family's swimming pool when Casey wasn't watching her. And they say that it was Casey's father, George, who actually found Kaylee. And to cover up the death, they dump her body in the swamp and claim that they don't know where she is. Now, in the courtroom, the defense has a mock-up of the Anthony house. And the defense presents this scene of George holding Kaylee in his arms after he finds her in the pool And the defense is acting like he's George and he's yelling at Casey saying, look what you've done. Your mother will never forgive you and you will go to jail for child neglect for the rest of your freaking life. And then they say that George helped Casey cover it up. And so to me, it just kind of seems like this defense comes out of nowhere because we'll even talk a little bit later, like Casey even says herself, she doesn't know what happened. So she's saying that that didn't really happen. George denies this too. 
And so it's just like the defense just made this up so they had some sort of defense, some accidental death. And yeah, so I find this such a strange part of the case because the defense is saying that George was involved. And when George was questioned at the trial, they say that he was present when Kaylee died. The defense tried to paint him as a liar, and they even bring in a woman named Crystal Holloway, who also goes by the name River Cruz. And she also testifies that she had an affair with George. And George testifies that she was just another one of the volunteers searching for Kaylee, and he denies ever having a romantic relationship with her. And Crystal even testifies that George told her that Kaylee's death was an accident and everything just snowballed out of control. And of course, George denies this as well. So it's like the defense can't get their theory straight. They're attacking George. Like, it seems weird that they're bringing him into this when he is denying that he was a part of it. You think the defense would maybe figure out a story that everyone could agree on at least. But so that seems strange to me. And also, I just want to bring up like George was a former police officer. And so if he was a part of this cover up, first of all, they didn't do a very good job of disposing of her body because she was like so close to the house and you just think he'd be a little bit more careful or would know a little bit more about how things are done being a former police officer and thinking that he could get away with it I don't know so just a weird little part of the case that I just didn't really fully understand why they would go this route yeah and I think in real time when I was watching or following this case back in 2011 it does come out really out of nowhere because there's no indication of any of this theory of an accidental drowning or any of the stuff of George being involved. So when defense is presenting this as their theory for the first time, it's really such a turn because you don't really know. Obviously now in hindsight, when you have everything that, like I mentioned in the previous episodes, that Casey is saying allegations against her father and all that stuff, there is a lot of question on George. So like now kind of makes sense. But at the time it was like, where is all this coming from? This is brand new information that no one's ever heard before. So it really did seem like it was just grasping at any any type of thing to save Casey. And I guess like I mentioned a little bit before too in the previous episodes, they have to paint George as this villain in the story because if you you make the jury question George, then it throws kind of everything off because George testifies and If you're already questioning him, like that's going to really put a wrench in the prosecution's case. So I guess that was really their goal here is just to like make George lose his credibility, make you not believe him. But it really does come out of nowhere. Well, it kind of fits their their narrative. You would think this whole George thing was just something that they brought up. But when I was watching her own documentary that she put out, well, not herself, but anyways, when she's talking about this drowning, it's like she was asleep the whole time and Kaylee was like beside her and, and she was like, Kaylee would never like just get up and go randomly like wander throughout the house, which I mean, like she's what, two? I, I mean, kids wander sometimes, but I don't believe the whole drowning situation. I don't think that never, I don't think that even ever happened. No, me neither. And I mean, that is the story she's sticking to as well. Like, yeah, in that documentary that I, I mentioned before, like where the truth lies. Yeah, she's sticking to that drowning story. It's not really believable. Oh, she does stick to that because the things that I looked up, she says herself that she still doesn't know what happened. So, I mean, she's a liar. So she changes her story from one thing to the next. Yeah, she's a liar. So, yeah, because this documentary came out in 2021, I think, like late 2021. And as of then, she was saying that she, she drowned and she recounts the story. Like Steph was saying, she fell asleep. She wakes up. Kaylee's no longer next to her. And then she is searching the house and then finds George carrying Kaylee after having drowned. Maybe her memory came back because the last I heard that she said was, yeah, she fell asleep. And then she woke up and this Kaylee wasn't there and she just never saw her again and didn't know what happened. So, yeah. Like, I don't believe George was just standing there with Kaylee in her arms. Like, that doesn't even, like, that just doesn't seem plausible to me. This kind kind of sounds like a dream. Well, I mean, it's possible, like, if he did find her in the swimming pool and, like, carried her out, but... But did you look... Did you see the pictures of what the pool looked like? Like, she'd have to climb the ladder and, like, get down, like, in this pool. Like, she couldn't just, like, fall in the pool. No, she probably... Maybe she could have wanted to go swimming, like, kids like swimming, but... So she could have just tried to get in there herself. I don't know. I guess. But I don't think that's true at all. I don't think that happened. So... And even if it did, like, why... Just, okay, let's just chuck her in the swamp instead of trying to do anything about it, right? So that comes up a little bit later, too. It doesn't make any sense. 
maybe the defense presented this just kind of get the heat off Casey a little bit and be like, yeah, look at this other person who may have done something or is guilty, not Casey. Because, I mean, the defense is really there just to defend Casey, not anybody else. Yeah, so kind of continuing on with this theory, like Dr. G, the medical examiner, she testifies at the trial and she says that this defense's scenario is very unlikely and kind of like we were just saying she claims that typically in an accidental death of a child the parent or caregiver or whoever finds the child in distress always calls 911 even if they're floating in a pool and not breathing and they seem to already be dead they always call 911 because as a frantic scared parent you want help immediately no matter what like I can't picture anyone who's actually cares about their kid and is scared, sees their child floating, and doesn't call 911, you know what I mean? So usually you wouldn't just assume that they're dead already and do nothing, or just... And of course you certainly wouldn't just dump them in the woods if it truly was an accident. So Dr. G is just saying that this whole thing doesn't really add up. Going back to George for a minute here, he actually tried to commit suicide during this whole thing when, when Kaylee was found, but before the trial... So, on January 22nd, 2009, Brad Conway, who is George and Cindy's lawyer, he calls 911 and says that George had taken several bottles of medication and then left the house. And George had gone to a motel and he texted his family saying he didn't want to live anymore. And then he took an overdose of those prescription pills and alcohol. And he wrote a six-page suicide letter. And because of those texts, the police were able to figure out where he was and they saved him before he actually did die. But in the letter, he says that he blames himself for Kaylee being gone. But he doesn't go into, like, detail. And he, there's not like there's a confession that he knew about the murder or he knew it was an accident. And typically, this is a place where someone would be at their most honest like you know like deathbed confessions or someone's about to die so they want to kind of tell the truth and so the prosecution points out that the defense's theory of George having known about how Kaylee died is incorrect as he likely would have confessed something in here if he knew and maybe kind of to give Casey a defense he could have said something about what happened if he did know and so they're saying it's very unlikely that he knew anything because this is where he would have said it if he thought that he was actually going to die. So that's just like a whole interesting part of this case as well. So of course, the defense also has an answer for that search for chloroform. So Casey's mother, Cindy, she testifies that she was looking up chlorophyll on the internet. If you don't know, chlorophyll is like the green pigment found in plants. And when she searched for chlorophyll, it resulted in searches for chloroform instead or by accident or was misspelled or something and so that's where the chloroform came up on the computer so it was actually an accident like i said they also say that the amount of chloroform found was very small and it's like the amount that you might expect to find in some cleaning products like i said before so they're trying to discredit this whole chloroform debacle here they're saying that it wasn't actually searched for if it was it was because it was by mistake cindy didn't mean to for the record, I did just try it out. I did type in like chloro into Google. I typed in and chloroform is the first result and chlorophyll is second. So like if you're typing in, if you get to like C-H-L-O-R-O and then you click the first thing that's on the list, like chloroform is the first one. So I just wanted to see like if it was even possible. Yeah. So, I mean, have you ever done that search for something, click on something different by mistake? You go to some random website and you're like, oh, and then you've got to back out of it and go somewhere else. So it's not unbelievable that that could have happened. Yeah, it's definitely a plausible scenario. Yeah. And of course, the defense here is, is trying to just like discredit everything that the prosecution brings forward. And they so they also bring up that the duct tape as well that was found. And the prosecution claims that it was wrapped around Kaylee's skull when they found her and that there was hair intertwined into the threads of the tape. But the defense claims that the tape could have been used to seal the plastic bags that she was in when she was disposed of, and that it wasn't actually wrapped around her mouth, even though they found it wrapped around the skull. Like, they're saying maybe it could have shifted during decomposition. But Dr. G says that there is proof that the tape was around her mouth before or soon after the body started to decompose, because it was holding the jaw in place on the skull. 
And so very often when decomposed remains are found, the jawbone is often separated from the skull because there's nothing to hold it in place after all the tissue and muscle has broken down. So if you picture like a skull, the only thing that's holding like the jawbone there basically is like the tissue. And so once that's gone, it kind of separates. And she says the fact that the jaw was being held in place by the tape proved that it was intentionally put there and it was put around her mouth. So I think that's a good point. She's kind of saying like the science points to the duct tape being around her mouth. Another important piece of evidence that comes up and that we have talked about before was that smell of decomposition that was coming from Casey's trunk. And so as we mentioned, cadaver dogs did hit on the trunk indicating that there was human remains inside at one point. And the prosecution actually turns to Casey's friend Amy, who AJ mentioned in a previous episode, and she testifies that Casey actually mentioned that there was a bad smell coming out of their car but she didn't know what it was. And another time she told Amy that the smell was getting worse and she thought maybe that her dad had run over something when he borrowed the car or that there was like a dead squirrel in the car or something. Amy actually testified for the prosecution because they're using this to claim that Casey had planned all of this. They claim that she was planting the idea that there was a bad smell in her car so that she had proof or an explanation if she was ever questioned about it. And so that's kind of where the premeditated murder comes in. It's like she's kind of planning all this out before things happen. And so that was her excuse for the smell, if it ever came up. And as we know, Cindy testified that, yes, she said it did smell like something had died in the car. Like we heard on that 911 call, she said that it smelled like something was dead in the car. But then later, she also admitted that she made a rush judgment and said that what she smelled was likely the stench of an old pizza that was rotting in the trunk for almost two weeks. So if you remember, there was, I guess Casey had put garbage in the trunk, or there was like a pizza in there, and then it was abandoned for a couple weeks, and so once I opened it, it was all that like rotting garbage smell in there. And like we said before, the smell of human decomposition is very distinct, and anyone who's ever smelled it never forgets it, like we talked about this before. So... Even some people said that, like some of the investigators said that they smelt it and that is what it smelt like. So they felt like that is what they were smelling. But, and I guess this is apparently why trained dogs can differentiate between human remains and other smells. And like we talked about before, we know that cadaver dogs aren't always 100%. Even if they did hit on a specific place, it's not guaranteed that what they're smelling is human remains or that there was a dead body there before. And in the case of Kaylee Anthony, that docu-series... They do a blind test, so they have human remains, like some tissue from something, some human tissue. They have animal remains, and they also have a rotting pizza to try and see if the dog can find the human remains and kind of ignore the other things that might be distracting it. And in this particular test, the dog was able to kind of go straight to the human remains and hit on that and not be distracted by the other smells. So, like we said... It's possible that the dog knows what it's smelling, but it's also possible for it to get distracted and just think it's smelling something or just get excited and hit on something that may not have been there. So it's not an exact science. So this is another piece of evidence that it could go either way. Yeah, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, but there's no way to prove it. I don't think we talked about this already, but there was another thing that was brought up by the prosecution, and that was a strand of hair that was found in the trunk of Casey's car. So it was just one strand, and... They say that there was evidence of decomposition on the hair follicle, and they call this postmortem root banding. So if you look at it under a microscope, you can kind of see like this dark band on the hair follicle, and that represents decomposition. And the prosecution presented the idea that this could only happen while it's still attached to a deceased person's head. But Dr. F- Peter DeForest, who is a, a forensic trace analyst he discusses this in the case of kaylee anthony series and he's shown the photo of that exact hair that the prosecution was talking about um and he says it does have characteristics of post-mortem banding and he says to get this kind of pattern on the root of someone's hair they would have to be deceased for at least two or three days also he says that certain solutions or chemicals can also change the ph of hair follicles 
and it can make similar bandings on the hair root. So it's not an absolute resolution. So if you see that type of banding on the hair, it doesn't absolutely 100% mean that it was attached to someone that was dead. And also Dr. Henry Lee even says that if you pluck a hair out and place it in water at room temperature, sometimes you can see post-mortem banding. So I guess what they're trying to say is just because they saw it doesn't mean it came from Kaylee when she was dead in the trunk. So again, this is another thing, well, it could have been, but also there's explanations for why it could not have been that as well. And they also mention that just having one hair in the back of the trunk is very unusual because you think you'd have like a chunk or there'd be more than one. So they're saying it's probably just got there some other way. But like if they're trying to say that certain chemicals can change that banding, so are they trying to say that there was a chemical present in the trunk that then changed the banding to make it look like it had come from the a dead person's head? Like that's kind of what I thought too. It's like, well, why would this why would that have that postmortem banding if A, it didn't come from the deceased person's head, then what caused it to have that pattern, I guess, right? Because like I feel like if you're gonna present someone who's gonna say, like, well, it can be changed by something. You have to then present like a plausible theory of like what could have changed it, right? I feel like you would have to. Yeah, so the prosecution just presented that this was present and they said that it only happens when it comes out of someone that's already been deceased. But I think it was later after the trial when they kind of go into this more and it was like separate experts saying that it doesn't always happen that way. So I don't think the prosecution presented that, oh, chemicals can do it too. Like nobody really touched on that until it was after and it's just like a separate thing in this documentary. Oh. Yeah. So I guess I should have clarified that just so it's not confusing. But I guess it wouldn't even mattered because the prosecution said that that's what it was and that's where it was and nobody kind of refuted that. But I guess it just it still wasn't really strong enough for people to hold on to that. There is possibilities for it to be something else, I guess is the point here. Okay, so yeah, so moving on to more evidence, we talked about this guy named Roy Kronk in previous episodes, and they tried to attack Roy Kronk's character to try and say that what he did, you know, kind of mess up the case and mess up the evidence. And so defense lawyer Jose Baez says, quote, Mr. Kronk is a morally bankrupt individual, end quote. Because they are saying that he took Kaylee's body and he hid her and then he brought her back later just to get the reward. And they allege that he said, quote, do I still get the reward even though she's dead? End quote. And then they say that on December 11th, when he brings his boss to the scene, Roy is just kind of leaning up against a truck, smoking a cigarette, and he says, quote, I just won the lottery. And so I guess you know, referring to he's going to get this big reward for finding her remains. And so the defense is trying to poke all the holes they can into what was actually found at the scene by blaming Roy. And as AJ talked about previously, he may have moved the skull a little bit by lifting up the bag. But he says that's just when he noticed the skull, like it didn't even necessarily fall out of the bag when he lifted it up. He just lifted up the bag and then that's when he happened to notice that there was a skull by his feet as well. And yeah, and again, they use this four month gap in between Roy's calls as proof that he took the parts and hid them. And we went over this already, like they questioned why he would wait that long. But like we said before, it's not his job as a citizen to follow up on what the police are doing. He put this tip in more than once. And why should he be the one that has to keep going back to see if anyone has done anything about it? One call to the authorities should have done it. But he says that big four-month gap, like he had personal and kind of health issues going on. So he didn't go back in those four months. But then when he did again, he called again. So he's not like he didn't try, like we said. He was very persistent. And so basically the defense is saying that anything found at the scene is unreliable because of Roy's tampering. Yeah, so still continuing on with these remains, the defense brought in Dr. Jane Bach, who was a forensic botanist who said that in her opinion, the shortest amount of time that the remains could have been there was two weeks due to some of the things that she saw at the scene, like leaf litter on the log beside the remains and the amount of decay of that log. And just like things along those lines that kind of told her that these remains 
were kind of placed there later. However, another forensic botanist, Dr. David Hall, he was called by the prosecution and he says that there is no way that there would be that much root growth in the remains in just two weeks. So just a little bit of background, like when they look at all the remains, like the skull, the bones, the clothes, there was roots that had grown all up in there. And he's saying that two weeks is not enough time for that to have happened. So there's no way that someone could have taken them, put them there, and then in two weeks later they were found. Um, and so Dr. Hall was actually at the original scene when the remains were found. He was called by the sheriff's office when the remains were discovered. And so he was actually there looking at the growth and the condition in which the remains were in. And Dr. Bach was just looking at his report and she like disagreed with it. And she was the one saying that, yeah, they, like in her opinion, they could have been there for only two weeks. And Dr. Hall says that the remains definitely were moved, but it was likely just because animals had moved them and like animals do, they get into them and like move them around a little bit. This is kind of just another example of the experts can't agree on on the subject matter. And yeah, and the prosecution, of course, picking someone that's going to go with them and then the defense finding someone else that's going to disagree. And yeah, so like I said, the prosecution claims that the the remains were never moved or just only moved by wildlife and that the plant growth in and around the bones would have taken months to do. There was roots growing in and around the blanket that was found on the scene, roots growing through the hair, into the plastic bag. And Dr. Hall actually said like decomposition would actually slow down the growth of roots because all the body fluids that would seep into the ground actually delay growth. So it would take even longer for those roots to get into everything. He estimates that the body would have had to have been there about four months or so to have that kind of root growth. And so it's very unlikely that Roy or anyone would have moved the remains and then just put them there at a later date. If they were there for four months, that's like August to December is four months. But if Kaylee really died in June, like where was she from June to August? Yeah. Well, I guess he was saying like the shortest amount of time would be four months, but it could have been oh, okay. longer than that. So at least four months is what he's saying. But yeah, it definitely could be longer as well. But definitely not two weeks, I guess, is his point. I love how like the just the back and f- not not that I love this case, the back and forth between like the prosecutor and the defense. So much disagreement. It, it kind of like what I look forward to when I'm looking for trials is like how much can they disprove each other? I know, that's what makes it so interesting. It's like the they have this evidence and then an expert that says this is what it is, but then they ha- somebody else has another expert and says, no, this is how it happened. So it's just really, I guess, who is more convincing. Yeah, and like if you have two experts, they can each have two, they can both be experts in the same field, but they could have two different expert opinions. So it's really hard for, as a jury member, when you're taking all that in, it's like, well, whose expert opinion do I believe the most if they're both experts? Exactly. But I think in this case, I think I would tend to believe the person that was actually on site and saw everything not just like a third party that's coming in and just reading the report but that's just me (laughs) yeah i agree too yeah and so the defense continually harped on the fact that the medical examiner could not come to a conclusion about how kaylee died and there was no obvious cause of death that could be scientifically substantiated And so Dr. G does agree that there was not enough left of the body in this case to find a cause of death and that there was no physical injuries to the bones to suggest blunt force trauma or a gunshot, for example, like things like that that are really obvious in an autopsy. So if someone's shot or stabbed, usually the bones can tell you that because there's a mark on the bones or there's like a literal hole through the bones that that makes it really obvious. But in this case, there was nothing like that. So they know that she wasn't beaten or stabbed or shot. And so there really is no way to tell how she died because it was just bones. And she says that there's enough evidence to say that it is a homicide because of all the circumstances surrounding the death. And it doesn't fit anything other than a homicide. But then, of course, the defense says, well, you know, they can't even tell you how she died. So how are you going to say it was a murder? And we talked about this, some of the circumstantial evidence that was surrounding this case as well. We talked about that in the previous episode. And 
yeah, the state kind of collected boxes and boxes of evidence from the Anthony home a day after that Kaylee's remains were found. Like AJ talked about before, there was that cloth laundry bag that she was found in. Um, I think AJ said that there it was a pack of two that it was usually sold in. My research said that it was actually a pack of three and that they found two at the house and one was missing. But that doesn't really matter. It was just like a pack, I guess. And the one that they had found Kaylee in was the same material. It was the same brand. And it was like a matching bag that would have been in this set that was at the Anthony house. So like AJ said, how how common was that laundry bag? But anyway, that's just, you know, it matched the ones at their house. And they also found that the same style and brand of duct tape at the Anthony house that was wrapped around Kaylee's remains. So that's another circumstantial piece. But again, you know, it's not like there's a billion types of duct tape. So finding the same brand would be like a miracle, right? There's only so many brands of duct tape. And so that's, it's just not strong enough to be like, oh, that's exactly what happened. Just little pieces here and there. Yeah, that that's kind of like the major pieces of evidence that were brought forward by both sides and kind of the battle that they had back and forth to try and disprove each other. Yeah, so it's like kind of like the epitome of like the courtroom drama of like one expert witness and then one that debunks that and then it's like going back and forth. So it really is kind of and there is so little concrete evidence, so little that we actually know for certain. Like we know, of course, that Kaylee had died, but there's so many questions about how and when and all of that stuff but one thing that the prosecution and the defense you know do agree on during the trial is really the date of Kaylee's death so both the prosecution and the defense do testify or they do present that June 16th is the day that Kaylee died Um, they just have two very different versions of how it happened on that day so obviously the defense is saying that on that day that's when Kaylee accidentally drowned in the family swimming pool and then the prosecution saying that that's the day that Kaylee was sedated with chloroform, killed, and then she was disposed of shortly after that. So I do have kind of a chronological breakdown of, you know, computer activity and cell phone activity from Casey of June 16th. So this is a really great source. Um, It's the state versus Casey Anthony analysis of evidence from the case. And so there's screenshots of her cell phone records um, from that day um, and also a screenshot of the home computer usage. So really good stuff to check out. We'll put a link in the show notes to that and some shots of the surveillance footage. But I'm just going to read mostly just the bottom portion of this article or this report, which has the chronological breakdown of with timestamps and such. Um, So I'm going to kind of read it word for word from this just to make sure I get it as accurate as possible. So and we'll link this in the show notes as well. So you can read it for yourself. But the chronological breakdown. So it starts at 7 a.m. 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. is the first window of time. It says Casey and Kaylee probably woke up around 7.30 a.m. after Casey's mother, Cindy, left for work. Casey's father, George, often fed Kaylee breakfast and probably did on this day as well. Casey went on the computer to check her Facebook and MySpace updates and have an IM chat with a friend. She also sent a text to her boyfriend. Then 9 to 10 a.m., there's no computer or cell phone activity during this time period. Presumably, Casey was eating breakfast or getting things prepared for the day at this time. Um, And then 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. So 12 noon is the next time frame. And during this time, Casey was back on the computer again. So she uploaded a photo of the Fusion nightclub to her photo bucket account. She was probably talking to her boyfriend on Facebook while she was on the computer because she received a Facebook text from him at 11.43 a.m. And this would only occur if she was logged out of Facebook at that time. So they said she got that text because she wasn't actually logged into Facebook on the computer she was on photo bucket, which I guess she couldn't be on both things on the computer at the same time, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. But her boyfriend called her at 1147 a.m., which was shown by cell phone records, and they have a 20 minute conversation. So if that would put her on the phone until 1207, if he calls at 1147 and then she they're on the phone for 20 minutes. So at some point, Casey needed to get ready for, quote, work, unquote, and needed to get her daughter ready as well. She did not use the computer during this time period, and there was no cell phone activity until 12.53 p.m. So her father, George, recalls seeing Casey and Kaylee emerge from Casey's room at 12.50 p.m. 
He walked them out of out to Casey's car and saw them drive away. Then Casey exchanges text messages with her boyfriend as she is leaving or as soon as she left the house. Then from one to two, although George Anthony saw his daughter leave in her car, the cell pings indicate that Casey did not go far enough for her phone to switch towers. So i.e. she was still in the vicinity of the Anthony house. She calls her boyfriend at 1 p.m. and has a 15 minute conversation. She then exchanged text messages with another friend, Jesse, at 1.26 p.m. Then she calls her friend Amy at 1.44 p.m. and they have a roughly 35-minute conversation. And Amy says that the conversation that they have was not unusual. So it was a 35-minute call, but it wasn't, you know, that was something that they would often do. So it wasn't alarming that they had this 35-minute call at that time. And then between 2 and 3 p.m., Casey came back home shortly before or after 2 p.m., the heaviest computer activity was seen during this time period. So it's reasonable to assume that she was checking her Facebook and MySpace accounts again between 2 and 3. And then her friend Jesse calls her at 2.52 and described a 12 minute, the 12-minute 12 conversation that they have as, quote, not normal, end quote. So if, he call, if she calls him at 12.52 and they're on the phone for 12 minutes, that would be 3.04 when she's off the phone. And then between 3 and 4, so there's no computer activity at all during the 3 to 4 p.m., time period and very little phone activity. Uh, Casey's father calls her at 304, but she was still on the phone with Jesse. She ends that call at that time and ignores her father's call at the same time. So that's when she gets off the phone at 304. Then she received a few Facebook messages from different people, but only responds to one that's sent by her boyfriend at 335 p.m. She tried to call him, but he did not answer. And then between four and five, from 410 p.m. to 414, Casey tried to get a hold of her mother by calling her cell and work phone. Four minutes later, she exchanged text messages with her boyfriend. Her cell phone was pinging from a different tower. Therefore, she was no longer the vicinity of her home. She probably was leaving or left the house when she started to call her mother. Then she tried to call a couple people. Considering that there was no more calls or texts between Casey and her boyfriend, she probably was at his apartment around 4.25 p.m. when she stopped calling people. This was validated by the fact that her phone was pinging the cell tower in the vicinity of his apartment from that time on. Then between 5 and 8 p.m., Casey's probably at her boyfriend's apartment, as indicated by the cell phone pings at that time. She tried calling a few people, but no one answers. And then between 12, or then between 8 p.m. and 12 a.m., so between 12 p.m. and midnight, Casey and her boyfriend go to Blockbuster around 8 p.m., which I mentioned in a previous episode that the surveillance footage sees her at Blockbuster that evening. They rent two movies. They come back home and watch the movies with her boyfriend's roommates. So the conclusion that they write in this web page is that whatever happened that day to Kaylee probably happened between 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. So 2 to 3 is when there's the heavy computer activity. So did something accidentally happen to Kaylee while Casey was on the computer between 2 and 3 p.m.? Or did Casey murder her child between 3 and 4 p.m.? And also, what was the nature of of all those calls she was trying to place to her mother between three and four. She tried calling her work phone and her cell phone multiple times, but she never reached her. So we don't know why she was calling. So which one is more reasonable? That's the question they pose. Like, do you think she was on the computer between two and three and something happened to Kaylee while she was distracted? Or did she do something between three and four to Kaylee? So I just wanted to kind of present that because that is what we know of her movements of that day. But also, if she's on the computer between 2 and 3 and something happened, that's also different from her own story when she says that she was sleeping and woke up to find Kaylee not there. So even the story she's telling now isn't even in line with what we know of, like, the computer activity and stuff from that day. So what are your guys' thoughts about that? I just feel that there's so much texting of people, her boyfriend, her friend, and, like, trying to call her mom and then her boyfriend again then like her other friend and I feel like there's so many other people that maybe she's trying to like confirm like an alibi or confirm whatever because there's like I feel like that that's just a lot of phone calls and wasn't didn't she say she was on her way to work like quotes work but yet yeah but she didn't have a job at that time no but her parents didn't know that but all these phone calls were coming in like she's doing all these phone like I don't understand why why she was calling people so many times it almost seems like something happened to Kaylee, right? Like she had an accident or she, Casey found her and was like frantic and was trying to call people for help. Not the police, but her mom. So it kind of makes you sort of maybe lean in that direction. 
because that makes sense if a normal person would do that maybe but i don't know yeah and i and i guess like the presumption is like so george says he last saw kaylee and casey as they left her house left the house at around one or just before one um and then i guess he goes off leaves the house and goes to work and then she comes back to the house after that time and maybe i guess he but then according to her story like he's back there up between three and four when all that stuff happens so very just weird wouldn't he question where kaylee was if if he was home with her and kaylee wasn't there well no kaylee was there well in the morning yeah they were there in the morning they left together she said that she was going to drop kaylee off at the nanny and then she was going to go to work but then she comes back to the house because she's still using the family computer between two and three i guess according to this report um so yeah i don't know he must have left the house again i don't know but it's just and she wasn't working so and the mother never called her back no i don't think she ever did reach her mother so she tried multiple times and did they ever question the mother like why she was calling her well yeah i think that when cindy's like brought on the stand and just says like she got calls like her mom was at work right so she's not going to answer her phone necessarily her mother was a nurse so yeah i would have like if one of my kids called me at work like randomly like i would probably answer the phone but you can't always like you don't always have your phone on you when you're working for a lot of jobs yeah like she was a nurse and like i'm sure she's probably lots of action happening like i don't know if she's an er nurse but apparently she tried calling the work phone and her cell phone multiple times but never got through never left a message or anything yeah, it kind of also maybe something happened and then Casey was frantic and maybe needed her mom because it was her mom, but also because her mom was a nurse. So maybe she was like, help, what should I do about this situation? Couldn't get a hold of her. Things went south really fast. And that's when she decided to cover it up. Like, that's plausible. But I mean, I of course, we'll never know. Yeah. According even the screenshot from the computer activity shows like between two and three is the most computer activity but again we don't know for sure that that's casey it could be george doing that computer stuff we don't know but i mean i guess the heaviest computer activity was seen during between two and three it's reasonable to assume she was checking her facebook and myspace accounts again but again there's no like concrete record someone at the house was using the computer at that time but i don't know it's just again so many unknowns and there's so many like different people involved that she's texting and so many people she said she was doing this there and it's just very confusing. So I guess we just don't know. But the one thing that they agree on is that June 16th is the day that Kaylee did die, whether it was accidental drowning or murder. Uh, we just don't know any other details really beyond that. And the rest is just sort of speculative or based on circumstantial or some criminating evidence. So it's just very hard to, to tell in this case. And that's just the nature of this particular case is nothing is so concrete, I guess. So, yeah, very interesting trial for sure that went on for many weeks and many people were glued to the TV for the for the trial. Um, I know I was one of those people kind of following it as it was going on. So, yeah, that kind of wraps up, I guess, good place to end this part of the episode. And yeah, we want to know your theories as well, too. Like based on that, the timeline that I broke down, what do you think happened that day that afternoon which theory are you most believable or like what are your thoughts on all the stuff that katie brought up she brought up a lot of good stuff like forensic evidence and all the different experts so let us know what you think of that and if we have left anything out or anything like that you want to let us know you can too so we're on all the social medias at crime family podcast on facebook and instagram um, on twitter crime family pod one and join us on the patreon you can support the show and get some extra content um, you can also buy some merch from our merch store we'll have the links to those things below in the show notes and always interact with us as many ways as possible we'd love to hear your opinions follow us on social media go to our website all that stuff um, that we always say at every episode um but yeah we'll be back with next week with part four of the kaylee anthony murder case or the death of kaylee anthony and the casey anthony murder trial so until then take care bye bye bye